fidelity high, the people you dig, the records they love. Alice Cooper is a music legend and is widely renowned as the godfather of shock rock. Discovered in 1969 by Frank Zappa and signed to his Straight Records label, he has sold over 50 million records and is responsible for the smash hits I'm 18, School's Out, No More Mr. Nice Guy, Only Women Bleed, Feed My Frankenstein, and more. He has also been seen in multiple films, including a role as Freddy Krueger's abusive stepfather in Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, and most memorably as himself in the Mike Myers and Dana Carvey 1991 smash comedy Wayne's World. He is also the owner of the Phoenix-based restaurant and sports bar, Cooperstown, and hosts a weekly radio show, Nights with Alice Cooper, that is syndicated to over 100 stations worldwide. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame along with the other original members of the Alice Cooper Band in 2011. 2017 saw the release of his 27th studio album, Paranormal. It was produced by his longtime collaborator, Bob Ezrin, and features Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top, Larry Mullen Jr. of U2, Roger Glover of Deep Purple, and the other surviving original members of the Alice Cooper Band, Michael Bruce, Dennis Dunaway, and Neil Smith. This is Alice Cooper, and my fidelity high is Eli and the 13th Confession by Laura Nero. I was living in Los Angeles in the probably mid to late 60s, and, uh, you know, there was such a great glut of music going on. There was Love, De Capo. There was The Doors. There was, you know, King Crimson, T-Rex. All these great bands were out there. And somebody played me this album. And I was probably smoking, you know. I was probably a little high or something. And it just attached itself to me. You know, I listened to it and I went, wow, this woman is amazing. I didn't know anything about her. I didn't know anything about who Laura Nero was or where she was from or anything, but every single song was from her inner soul. This poetry that was coming out of her was so un unusual. You know, I'm used to listening to Chuck Berry, and Chuck Berry lyrically was probably the greatest lyricist of all time. If he couldn't think of a word, he'd make one up. And she would do the same thing. It was so different than anybody else. It didn't sound like Judy Collins. It didn't sound like, you know, um, any of the, the California girls. Or, but she was pure New York, sort of like the Bowery in New York. And there was something really poetic and something really Broadway about her, even though she was just a hippie chick from, you know, from the village. Um, Poverty Train, I started listening to it and started realizing it was about cocaine. You know, that it was, uh, she probably did her share of cocaine and maybe even heroin, I'm not sure. Because a lot of the stuff gets a little dark. Some of the lyrics get a little bit dark when you're following the poetry where it's going. And you start realizing she's not talking about a train, she's talking about her veins. Talking about cocaine and drugs back then was really a no-no. I mean, you know, you have to remember, in 1968, if you got caught with a seed, a marijuana seed, you'd go to jail. So the fact that she was going on and on about it, and you actually had to find it in the lyrics. If you listened to it five or six times, you started going, oh, oh, and I know what she's talking about now. I mean, she says it once, I think, in one song. Um, but she refers to it a lot. David Geffen, I think, discovered her and was the one that kind of like put her in the studio and said, I'm going to surround you with the, the best players in the world. David Geffen saw what, what I saw in her first and produced her and, and really did a great job, did a great job of bringing these songs to life because I've heard her play live too. I went and saw her play live a few times. And she could do everything on piano and just vote. You don't, didn't need the orchestration because she could do it just with piano in her voice. You know, so it was really interesting that you could take those songs, take it down to just nothing but piano and singer, and it still worked, because the songs were written so well. Um, of course, when you put the, 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 the guitars and the strings and the drums, and it's going to make it sound glorious. But, you know, uh, she could make that thing happen just in a club 
with no, no embellishment. If I hear a female singer and she's got something and she gets up there and she can sing and, you know, I sit there and I listen to her and I go, wow, you're really good, really good. I want you to listen to somebody and I'll give her the Eli album. I'll say, just listen to this and see what you can take out of it, see what you can draw out of it. They always come back and go, someday, maybe I can sound like that. And I went, well, I don't want you to sound like that, but understand that this is out there. In other words, we, we listened to Sgt. Pepper and realized we were never going to make that record, but boy, it was, a, it was good to store all that information in the back of your head because someday some of that's going to come out in your, in your form. You know, everybody was influenced by that. Uh, people are afraid to admit it, probably. There are probably metal bands out there that will not admit this, but they have the Carpenter's Greatest Hits in their collection. <laughs> and they will go, no, you don't. Yes, you do. And you have Saturday Night Fever there somewhere, too. Laura Nero's songwriting abilities were immediately recognized with many of her peers interpreting her songs. Three Dog Night covered Eli's Comin' and The Fifth Dimension recorded Stone Soul Picnic and Sweet Blindness, all songs featured on her sophomore album, Eli and the Thirteenth Confession. Barbara Streisand, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and Peter, Paul, and Mary would also score hits covering songs written by Nero as well. I think the fact that she had started out singing doo-wop on the streets uh, with uh, Spanish Harlem chicks and black girls is where she came up with a lot of her, her imagery and certainly a lot of her harmonies. But when Three Dog Night or Fifth Dimension, all they saw was the root of that song was great. And it really didn't matter what the lyrics were. The root of that song was so going to sound so good on the radio with them singing it. And yet, Laura Nero's versions were always better than the commercial versions. If you, if you listen to the two next to each other, you, you'd always go, oh, well, that's, this one's better. You know, it just had more soul to it. Uh, like, once again, it's not like any other, I listen to other girl singers and all this, and I go, huh, that's nice, that's nice. Okay, that's good. Oh, that's a good song, great song. And then I listen to this, and I go, this is Sergeant Pepper of that. You know, I mean, she was the, the un, undisputed heavyweight champion of this kind of song. So, I mean, it, 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 if you ask uh, most of your songwriters about Laura Nero, they'll say the same thing. You know, uh, Todd Rundgren and I, Todd is another one that just goes, oh, Laura Nero, are you kidding? Nobody better, you know. I was surprised when I heard him say that because I went, oh, I have a kindred spirit there. And if you asked probably Carol King, she'd say the same thing. <laughs> the Alice Cooper Band released their debut album, Pretties for You, the year after Columbia Records issued Nero's Eli and the Thirteenth Confession. Along with the other original members of the band, Alice Cooper was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2011. The following year, Laura Nero was inducted to the hall herself alongside multi-million selling legends such as Guns N' Roses, The Beastie Boys, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Donovan, and The Faces. You know, in, in, the, in the Hall of Fame, you always think of the mega bands. You think of the bands that, uh, you, oh, well, they've got to be in the Hall of Fame. You know, well, that band has to, you know, of course, the Rolling Stones, of course, the Beatles. I mean, there's just no, you wouldn't have a Hall of Fame without those people. And then you sit back and you go, well, what is the Hall of Fame about? Is it about record sales or is it about contribution? Is it about what somebody brought to the table that nobody else had ever brought to the table? Is it about consistency in writing? Is it about total belief and not backing off from what you believed in um, and making these records viable to everybody? It's not always about selling records. Um, if that was true, certainly the Sex Pistols would not have, you know, been in there or the Ramones would not have been in there because they didn't sell that many records. You know, I mean, it wasn't really mega records like 30 million or anything like that. And that's why I'm so glad that when I heard Laura Nero got nominated, I was really glad that there was a New York connection there 
with Stevie Van Zandt and Jan Wenner and, you know, all those guys because um, she deserved to be in. She totally deserved to be in. And same with Paul Butterfield Blues Band. I mean, they didn't sell a lot of records, but they were the epitome of the Chicago blues sound for the 60s. Not Howlin' Wolf and those guys. They were great. They, they were the originers, originators of the, the blues, you know, the Chicago blues. But then you take a band, a hard rock band, like Paul Butterfield, and put it into motion with electric guitars and this, and it's, oh, it's something that's glorious. You know, didn't sell a lot of records. But it was something that any musician could not deny. They would listen to that and go, oh, my gosh, nobody plays like that. Nobody can play like that. So I was really glad they got recognized in the Hall of Fame. There's, there's so many people that deserve it. Tom Waits, you talk about who sold a lot of records, not Tom Waits, but his contribution, amazing. You know, he came in with a whole new thing that was different, you know, and, and it was so much fun to listen to. You know, so it, the, the Hall of Fame is not based on record sales. It's inducted in... Uh, in 2011, with Tom Waits, by the way, and, uh, and Dr. John, who was another total freak out there that, that never sold records but really did really well. You know, we were an oddity. We sold 50 million records, and we were like a freak show. We were this, you know, strange you know, vaudevillian insanity, but we did sell a lot of records because we made good records. <laughs> that was Bob Ezrin, you know. But it... It's great to me to know that the Hall of Fame, Laura Neuer gets in on 2012, the next year, and I went to that Hall of Fame because I wanted to see Bette Midler put her in, you know, induct her. That was, that was important to me. Same with Lou Reed. Lou Reed was another one that was a total unique character that deserved to be in. Produce for You had to be, well, 68, 69, right in that era, it's probably 21. Well, our parents had to be there when we signed the contract with Frank Zappa because we were too young. We were in our 20s. You know, we, I mean, we were just 19 and 20 years old, the original band. And our parents had to come and sign the contract with Frank Zappa because we, we were not legal yet. And um, that, was, that was a funny, I, I always wanted to see that picture of my mom and dad and all the, all the guys in the band's mom and dad Standing there with Frank Zappa, <laughs> signing a contract. <laughs> we're, we're crafting songs. We're trying to sound like the Yardbirds. We're trying to sound like a, a unique version of the American Yardbirds kind of thing, but even twi more twisted, more theatrical. And yet, we're listening to De Capo by Love. We're listening to, you know, uh, albums that you probably wouldn't, connect with us at all. We were listening to, to um, electronic music. Uh, we were listening to, you know, a Saucer Full of Secrets and uh, uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn and Porco Harum. We were listening to things that, were, that we, sounded nothing like us. In other words, we didn't sit and listen to Frank Zappa that much. We loved Only Enough for the Money and Absolutely Free. That was hysterical funny. But we didn't listen to it musically. We were listening more to a combination of The Who and The Kinks and trying to twist it in an American sort of Frankenstein way. Um, so what we came up with was our version of the British invasion, <laughs> if, if there's such a thing. And... Uh, but we let these kind of things seep in. Let it influence us a little bit. You know, there's a melody line. So if you listen to Alice Cooper songs, there's a lot of melody. We, we, we did not depend on riff and, you know, drum things. It, it, when you're working with Bob Ezrin, you had to work with a lot of melody. And we wanted to because we were influenced by the Beatles more than anybody else, I think. Everybody was. Um, so... Nothing better than a great melody line. And then you can wrap a great guitar around that. And you can wrap some attitude and a great lyric around that. Then you've got something, you know. That's where our hits came from, really. Um, and I think everybody else was trying to do that, too. 
you know, everybody else was trying to, 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 to invent something new. After seven albums with the original band, Alice Cooper released his debut solo effort, Welcome to My Nightmare, in 1975. The album featured his first ballad, Only Women Bleed, and found commercial success. Oftentimes misinterpreted to be about menstruation, the song's narrative was one that sympathetically described a woman trapped in an abusive relationship. Ike and Tina Turner, Etta James, Tori Amos, the alternative rock band Luna, and many more have recorded their own versions of the song, and it was often used by Guns N' Roses during their Use Your Illusion world tour. The song remains a fan favorite, and one that is consistently featured during Alice Cooper's live performances to this day. Lonely Women was one of those songs that, it was like Only Women Bleed, and maybe Only Women Bleed was written because of that song, Lonely Women. Uh, it, it, I didn't do it on purpose, but it had to have made some register in me, you know, uh, a song about women that, you know, talks about that only women bleed, not, not physically, but emotionally. Uh, and that probably came from that song, but I can't sing about a lonely woman not being a lonely woman. <laughs> But I could sing about them, but she actually was that, you know. Uh, Timer's like the, the, I think the first song that is, it, she can get very melancholy. I want people to hear her stuff that makes you go, wow, that's up. That's really up. Timer's one of those songs. Lucky is one of those songs, you know. But Timer is one of the songs that I always start people off on. Um, Lucky would be the second one. Uh, it, it's again, it's a, it's a really up, up, up version of what she does. Then if you want to start getting into the really, really sort of dark world of Laura Nero, then you start getting into things like, uh, December's Boudoir, um, Poverty Train. You start getting a little bit more into her drug life and more into her love and drugs and how she combined it all together into the music. Um, that takes you a lot deeper into Laura Nero. And then she's pure pop. When, you, when you're talking about things like uh, S- uh, Sweet Blindness and um, Eli's Coming, Stone Soul Picnic, that's stuff that is just pure radio, great radio stuff, you know. But I always start, yeah, they can, you can get way into, if you get into the New York Tenderberry album, then it's re- fairly dark. That's a fairly dark album. It's not as up as the first two albums. But uh, this album had a nice combination of all of it. I think maybe that's why I like this album the best. It had the best, the best balance of, of what is Laura Nero. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe to the Fidelity High podcast on iTunes, and please also consider leaving a rating and review. All podcast episodes to date are also available on FidelityHigh.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Fidelity High.